So Mark chapter 3 says, And he entered the synagogue again. And a man was there who had a withered hand. And they watched him closely whether he would heal him on the Sabbath so that they might accuse him. And he said to the man who had the withered hand, Step forward. And then he said to them, Is it lawful on the Sabbath to do good or to do evil, to save life or to kill? But they kept silent. Of course, these religious leaders were using this man with a withered hand as bait to see if Jesus would indeed heal on a Sabbath day, which they said was illegal according to their tradition. And Jesus, you know, whenever he saw human need, whenever he saw broken people, hurting people, he was always moved with compassion for them. And he would do something about it. And when he had looked around at them with anger, being grieved by the hardness of their hearts, he said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he stretched it out and his hand was restored as whole as the other. Then the Pharisees went out and immediately plotted with the Herodians against him how they might destroy him. And so because they were shown to be hypocrites. These Pharisees went out and plotted with the Herodians. Now, they were natural enemies, but because they both hated Jesus, they came together to plot to put him to death. But Jesus then withdrew with his disciples to the sea. And a great multitude from Galilee followed him and from Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea and beyond the Jordan. And those from Tyre and Sidon, a great multitude, when they heard how many things he was doing, came to him. Huge crowds were following Jesus. Great multitudes, it says here. Jesus' ministry was gaining a lot of attention. He'd healed many people. He'd cast out many demons. Thousands were coming. And they were coming to him from up to a hundred miles away, walking, so that they could be near Jesus. And it says here at the end of verse 8, they came because they heard how many things he was doing. His fame had been spreading around. So they start to come. Now it's important for us to know that when Jesus entered the scene in Jerusalem, in, in Israel I should say, that he didn't come unannounced. It wasn't like he just plopped down out of heaven and nobody knew that the Messiah was coming. For over a thousand years, God had been sending prophets to the nation Israel saying, the Messiah is coming and this is what he's going to be doing. There are two veins of prophecy in the Old Testament. If you read through the Old Testament about the Messiah, the one vein would be that he would be a conquering king. And the other vein of prophecy was that he'd be a suffering servant. Now, the conquering king spoken of in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13. He says, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man coming with the clouds of heaven. Whenever Jesus refers to himself as the Son of Man, he's referring to this passage. They knew this to be a messianic passage of Scripture. A conquering king would come. It says that he came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him, Then to him was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. This was the conquering king. And then the other vein of prophecy was about the suffering servant. And you can read about that in Isaiah chapter 53. And in verse 3 there it says, He is despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we did not esteem him. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God and afflicted. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement for our peace was upon him. And by his stripes we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. 
And so there we have the prophecy about the suffering servant. Now the ancient rabbis couldn't put the two together in one person. So they came up with a theory that there would be two messiahs. They couldn't justify the conquering king and the suffering servant. How that could be one. So they thought there would be two messiahs coming. Now as we look back over time, we realize indeed Jesus came the first time as the suffering servant. But he's going to come again as the conquering king. So when he came on the scene in Israel, which one of those two veins of prophecies do you think they were looking for? They weren't looking for a suffering servant. They were looking for a conquering king. The Romans were in control. They wanted someone who would fight against the Romans and take off the yoke that Rome had put on Israel. And so that's what they were looking for. But you know something else that's interesting, a little more background. The Jews at that time also knew something else about Messiah. They knew that he would be a miracle worker. They knew that he would heal people and that he would cast out demons. Isaiah 42 verse 6 says this, I the Lord have called you in righteousness and will hold your hand and will keep you and give you as a covenant to the people, as a light to the Gentiles, to open blind eyes, to bring out prisoners from the prison, those who sit in darkness from the prison house. Opening blind eyes, healing people who are blind. And also bringing prisoners out of prison. This speaks about delivering people from demon possession. And so they knew that Messiah would be a miracle worker. And when I talk about Messiah, I'm talking about Christ. That's the Greek word for that, that term. Messiah being Mashiach in the, in the Hebrew. Anointed one, redeemer, the one who would come. Also, there's one other famous scripture that Jesus used and applied to himself. Isaiah 61 verse 1 says, The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me because he, the Lord has anointed me to preach good tidings to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to those who are bound to proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. And so they knew from these passages and others that the Messiah would come and he would preach, he would teach, he would heal, and he would cast out demons. That's what Jesus was doing in Israel. And so they heard about this. His fame was spreading all around. And the people thought, could this indeed be the Christ? Could this indeed be Messiah? In verse 9 there it says, So he told his disciples that a small boat should be kept ready for him because of the multitude, lest they should crush him. For he healed many, so that as many as had afflictions pressed about him to touch him. So the crowd, thousands of people pressing against Jesus. Now I don't know if you've ever been in, in a huge crowd, like at a concert or something, but it's a scary thing when huge crowds are pressing up against you. And uh, I remember being in the front row of a very large uh, concert one time. And I was just being picked up by my, off my feet and moved with the crush of the crowd. And it was really serious. You know, they were crushing against him. And you can't really blame them because they had all these afflictions. They just wanted to get there and touch Jesus, get near him. You know? And I can see that today. People want to come to the church. They want to come in. They just want to get near Jesus. I, I hear that Jesus is moving. I want to get close. Can't blame them. Jesus being moved with compassion whenever he sees human need. And so they, they kept a boat ready for him. And that would have been kind of cool. Out in the water, natural amphitheater, people on the beach. Jesus is out there and he can speak to multitudes of people and he can teach them. And the unclean spirits, whenever they saw him, fell down before him and cried out saying, You are the Son of God. But he sternly warned them that they should not make him known. Now these unclean spirits, demons, are known as lying spirits. Satan being the father of lies. And so he's not going to use lying spirits to tell other people about him. Jesus wouldn't do that. 
Now, I want you to notice, he sternly warned them that they should not make him known. Notice the power that Jesus has over demonic spirits. Demonic spirits are more powerful than any of us. But Jesus just says, don't say anything. And they have to obey him. They have to yield to Jesus Christ. He's got more power than any created being. Which tells me something. If Satan wants to come against me or come against you, he first has to go through Jesus Christ. Jesus has his hand of protection upon you. If you're here today and you're a Christian, Jesus' hand is upon your life. And for the enemy, Satan or his demons, to come against you, he must first go through Jesus. I like that. I like having my God as my protector. You know, I can stand behind him. Say, okay, Lord, Satan's knocking. You answer the door. And so he sternly warned them that they should not make him known and they had to obey him. And he went up on a mountain and he called those he himself, I'm sorry, he called to him those he himself wanted. And they came to him. And then he appointed twelve that they might be with him and that he might send them out to preach and to have power to heal sicknesses and to cast out demons. Now these were the apostles, the twelve. Now the word apostle means a sent out one. Someone who goes and who preaches and establishes the new work of God's kingdom in a place where it had never been before. These are the twelve that he's calling here. And notice what he says in verse 14. He appointed twelve that they might first of all be with him. I think this is important. That they might be with him. The vertical relationship that they had with Jesus Christ was the most important relationship that they had. And that's where all ministry flows from. If you want to serve God, your vertical relationship with God has got to be tight. Sometimes we think, you know, if I just get this knowledge or if I just get this information, then I can serve God. We need to spend time with Him. And then from that relationship, all ministry will flow. And it's interesting, when you do that, when you get alone with God, when you spend time with God, people notice. People just know that you've been with Jesus. It's interesting about the apostles. In the book of Acts, chapter 4, Peter and John had spoken to the leading Jews and they, they preached a sermon to them. And it says this in Acts chapter 4, verse 13. When they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated and untrained men, they marveled and they realized that they had been with Jesus. That's one of my favorite verses in the, in the whole Bible. They just had been with the Lord. They'd spent time alone with Him. And I want to encourage you in that. If you want to serve God to be with Jesus, just to spend time with Him alone. And so He points 12. And in verse 16 it says, top of the list here, and I think it's true that in every list, as far as I can remember, every list of the 12 apostles, Simon Peter comes in first. He's at the top of the list. It says, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter. Now, Simon's name is in, in the original Shimon or Simeon. And it means to hear. Okay? And he said that he would call him Peter. He would surname him Peter. Do you know when he did that? In Matthew chapter 16, he asked the disciples, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? And they said, well, some say that you're John the Baptist. Some say that you're Elijah or Jeremiah or one of the prophets. But he said, well, who do you say that I am? And Peter spoke up and he said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And he turned to him and he said, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. For flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father in heaven. Shimon, Simeon, he heard from the father who Jesus was. And at that moment, God changed his name. Jesus changed his name to Peter. Petros means rocky. 
a little rock. All right, you, were, you could hear. Now you're going to be rocky. And he says, upon this rock, I will build my church. The rock meaning the confession of Christ, the Petra. I'll call you Rocky, Petra, Petras, I'm sorry. But upon this rock, Petra, I will build my church. Upon that confession that you are the Christ. And the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So he heard properly and they changed his name. James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the name Boanerges. I think that's how you pronounce that. That is, sons of thunder. Now, I think that God has a sense of humor. Definitely. He calls these guys sons of thunder. You may remember the story that Jesus, when he was about to go into Jerusalem from Galilee, he had to go through Samaria. He's on his way up there to be crucified. And he set his face like a flint to go there. And as he's going through Samaria, he sends the disciples ahead to prepare the way into a certain village. And the villagers said, we don't want you to come through here, Jesus, because you're going to Jerusalem. And so James and his brother John said, Lord, do you want us to call fire down from heaven like Elijah did and just basically burn these people up? You know? And so Jesus said, no, you don't know what manner of spirit you are of. The Son of Man did not come to kill, but to save, not to destroy lives, but to save them. And so he names them Sons of Thunder. I think it's a, it's a crack up, you know. Here they, here they are walking around and Jesus says, hey, Sons of Thunder, you want to come along with me? You know, everybody would have known what that meant. It's interesting that later on, John who did call, he wanted to call down fire from heaven, he becomes what is known as the Apostle of Love. What a change God had made in his life. Wanting to burn people on the one hand, but now he's loving people. Then it says in verse 18, Andrew, who is Peter's brother, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, and that's Levi the tax collector, that dreaded tax collector, Thomas, who you may remember was the doubter who said, I won't believe that he's risen from the dead unless I can touch him. James, the son of Alphaeus, who was Matthew or Levi's brother. Thaddeus. Simon the Canaanite. He was also known as Simon the Zealot. Now, zealots were these guys in the first century who'd walk around with daggers in their cloaks ready to stab Romans. They were like first century terrorists. And Jesus chooses him to be on the team. I think that's kind of interesting that he's on the same team as Levi, the tax collector, who's working for the Romans. You know, can you imagine the natural hostility that would be there in that group? And yet the love of Christ brings people from all different backgrounds together in unity and want. Only Jesus can do that. Only Jesus can bring peace where there's disunity. And then it says, And Judas Iscariot, who also betrayed him, and they went into a house. Would you have chosen Judas? Well, you may have chosen Judas. He's probably, compared to all the other ones, he'd probably naturally be the guy that you would choose. But if you had supernatural insight and you knew everything, like Jesus did, would you still choose him? If you knew that he was going to betray you, would you still choose him? Jesus chose him. Jesus loved Judas. Jesus served Judas. Jesus cared for Judas. And even when Judas was betraying Jesus with a kiss in the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus turned to him and said, Friend, why have you come? Even in that moment, he called him his friend. I think that that just shows the long-suffering of God. God's love suffers long in his kind. And God's love can change you and He can change me too. You know, when you become a believer, the Bible says that the love of God is shed abroad in your heart and can absolutely transform your life. Jesus loved even Judas. Now, look at this list of guys. Twelve of them. Why would God choose these guys compared to some other guys? I mean... They were just ordinary people. 
They didn't have really any exceptional abilities. Even as they were following Jesus, they kept fighting over and over again about who would be the greatest. Who's going to be the greatest in your kingdom, Jesus? But something happened to all of these guys. And without exception, except for Judas, they came to realize something very important about God and about themselves. Their view of God, the more that they walked with God, their view of God went up and up and up, and their view of themselves went down and down and down. So much so that we read in 1 Corinthians 4.9 when Paul the Apostle writes to the Corinthian church, he says, For I think that God has displayed us, the apostles, last, as men condemned to death, For we have been made a spectacle to the world, both to angels and to men. Now, in a Roman theater, condemned criminals were thrown to lions in the morning with shields and weapons to defend themselves. If they survived that, they would be returned in the afternoon, last of all, to face gladiators, and they would be thrown into the arena completely naked with no weapons. Nothing to defend themselves. They were helpless and they were pitiful to look at. And so all the people in the arena would just be watching them be abused and beaten to death. They were, in the eyes of everyone in that arena, they were the lowest form of humanity. Paul says that's what the apostles are. In the eyes of the world, they're just low, they're just nothing. He goes on in 1 Corinthians 4, verse 13. He says... We have been made as the filth of the world, the offscouring of all things until now. The apostles were filth in the eyes of people of the world. That word filth comes from a Greek word, parakatharmata. It's a tongue twister. And it's what is collected when you sweep a house. It's the kind of the stuff you chuck in your wheelie bin and take out to the curb. That's the stuff that the apostles were in the eyes of the world. Filth. Also, he says, we were the offscouring of all things until now. That's the Greek word parapsima. This is the scum that you have to scrub hard to get off. You know, from time to time, I have to wash out the scum of my wheelie bin. You ever done that in your own wheelie bin? You know, you spill some milk in there and it, it really stinks after a while. And you get in and you have to scrub it out. And it just makes you want to gag. Well, that's the kind of stuff that he's talking about. He says, the apostles are the offscouring of all things until now. The smelly scum that comes out of the wheelie bin is what Paul said the apostles were in the eyes of the world. Their view of themselves went down and down and down. These are the guys that Jesus chose to be apostles. In the eyes of the world, They would become the scum of the earth, the lowest of the low. But you know what? God can use people like that. God can use nobodies. He can use losers. He can use filth. He can use offscouring and scum. God can use that. The Bible says in James 4, 6 that God opposes the proud, but He gives grace to the humble. The lower you go, the more you're usable in God's eyes. God's kingdom has just the opposite values of the values of the world. You know, sometimes we think that we have to be somebody to be used by God. We have to be somebody special to serve God. We have to be, you know, the beautiful or the rich or the intelligent or we have to have this great personality to serve God. Well, God isn't looking for somebody's He's looking for nobodies. He's looking for people who are poor and lame and blind and deaf. He's looking for people who admit who they are. Undeserved sinners. Scum. Nobodies. He's looking for people who will not be ashamed to be associated with Jesus Christ, who was a crucified Jew, who was considered the scum of the earth by people of the world. And we get to be associated with Him. He's looking for people who will give God all the glory 
for the things that He does through them. He's looking for people who will deny themselves and take up their crosses daily and follow Him. And that's true humility. You know, sometimes we think of humility as just running ourselves down. That's not really humility. It's just seeing ourselves as we really are. That's true humility. How do we get true humility? What well, says in James 4.10, Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord and He will lift you up. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. When you see Jesus, when you get a sight of the Lord, you humble yourself. When you see who He really is, it brings you down to where you really are. And so I want to encourage you. Get alone with Jesus and look to Jesus. Keep your eyes on Jesus and you will see yourself as you really are. That's why he used these guys. Because eventually they got it right. Eventually they got it right. And eventually we're going to get it right too. God's going to be working in our lives to bring us to that place where we realize who he really is and who we really are. Then the multitude came together so that they could not so much as eat bread. And when his own people heard about this, they went out to lay hold of him. For they said, he is out of his mind. In other words, he's beside himself. He's gone off the rails. He's crazy. He's mad. His own people came. That would be his family and his friends from Nazareth. They came down to take him. You're crazy. You're not even eating. You're just ministering to these people all the time. Wait a minute. Jesus, you've gone over the top with this religious thing that you're involved with. You ever heard that before? Maybe your own family thinks about you. You have gone over the top. Now, it's okay to you know, go to church. It's okay you know, to maybe go to church on Christmas or at, at Easter. But man, if, if you're reading your Bible, if you're taking your Bible to work, you're over the top. If you're talking about Jesus and praying in public, you're over the top. I mean, can't you just make it a private thing? You know, politics and religion is just a personal thing. You're over the top. And that's what Jesus was dealing with here. But Jesus, you know, he, he cared so much about the people that his, his own personal needs were put aside from time to time so that he could just minister to those people and their needs. Interesting story comes out of India. There's a ministry called Gospel for Asia you may know of. The leader of Gospel for Asia is a man named K.P. Yohannan. And he went to visit one of the missionaries there. And as he met this man and the guy picked him up in his car, he looked at this guy and apparently he had lost a lot of weight. His eyes were you know, black and sunken. And he just said, Brother, you don't look good. And the, the guy turned to... Brother KP, and he had a smile on his face, and he said these words. He said, So then, death is working in us, but life in you. It comes out of 2 Corinthians 4.12. The death that worked in him was bringing life to other people in that country. He was willing to lay down his life so that other people could have life, so that other people could hear the gospel. Now, of course... As you read through the gospel, you do see Jesus getting away from the crowds to pray, to rest, to eat, to refresh himself, spiritually and physically. He needed that. Some people, you know, they have this idea that, you know, I'd rather burn out than rust out in my service for God. But either way, you're out. You're out of the game. And we need to just be those who can serve the Lord, but also take time away to refresh ourselves. We need to be taking in as well as giving out. There is a time for that. But here Jesus is after and helping the people who need help. And he wasn't even eating. And so his own people thought he was crazy. Out of your mind. Well now, verse 22, we get to a very important scripture. It says, And the scribes who came down from Jerusalem said, He has Beelzebub, and by the ruler of the demons, he casts out demons. Now here in Mark's Gospel, he says the scribes said this. But if you read in Matthew's Gospel, 
in chapter 12, we have a little bit more additional information. It says here in Matthew 12, verse 22, Then one was brought to him who was demon-possessed, blind and mute, and he healed him, so that the blind and mute man both spoke and saw. And all the multitudes were amazed and said, Could this be the son of David? Now when the Pharisees heard it, they said, This fellow does not cast out demons except by Beelzebub, the ruler of the demons. When you put these two scriptures in Mark and Matthew together, you get a full picture of what happened. The multitude saw Jesus cast out a demon. And they knew that the prophets had said that Messiah would do these very things. And so they were thinking, could this be the Messiah? And they say to the leaders at the time, the Pharisees and the scribes, could this be the son of David? There's the term for Messiah. Could this be Messiah? And they put the leaders on the spot. Now, as we mentioned in our study last time, that the religion of the Jews in Jesus' day was what we know as Pharisaical Judaism. Now, what does that mean? It means that the Pharisees were the leaders of the Jews. It means that they were known as the spiritual authorities in Israel. And what they said, the people followed. And so if they said, when they were asked that question, if they said Jesus is Messiah, the people would have believed them. If they had said Jesus is demon-possessed, then the people would have believed that. So what would they do? They're put on the spot. Well, they reject Him. The leaders reject Jesus Christ as being the Messiah. He's demon-possessed. That's how he casts out demons. He casts out demons by the power of Satan. This was a huge moment in the history of the Jewish people, but also in the history of the world. Here was Jesus, God in human flesh, the Messiah of the Jews, the Savior of the whole world, standing before the religious leaders of his own people, and they reject him. John writes about this in in John 1.10. He says... He was in the world and the world was made through him and the world did not know him. He came to his own, that is his own land, is the, the land of Israel, and his own, that is the people of Israel, the Jews, did not receive him. By and large, the Jewish people did not receive Jesus Christ when he came the first time. Of course, the first Christians were Jews, weren't they? But by and large, the nation rejected him. But then John goes on to say this. But to as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become the children of God. Have you received him this morning? If you have received Jesus Christ, no matter what your background, you are a child of God. You have the right to be called and to become a child of God. The world didn't know him. His own people rejected him. But to anyone who will receive him, he will save them from sin and hell and he'll make them children of God. How's that done? Simply by believing in Jesus and receiving him. Receiving him as your Lord and your Savior. I'd encourage you to do that if you haven't done it. Verse 23 says, So he called them to himself and said to them in parables, How can Satan cast out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. And if a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan has risen up against himself and is divided, he cannot stand but has an end. So Jesus is saying it doesn't make sense that Satan would cast himself out or one of his demons out of a man. He would be defeating himself if he did that. No one can enter a strong man's house and plunder his goods unless he first binds the strong man and then he will plunder his house. Satan here is the strong man. And Jesus wants to come along and plunder the things that Satan has. What does he have that Jesus wants? Souls. He has people under his power, under his authority. The whole world lies sway under the wicked one, the Bible says. 
That doesn't mean that every person who is an unbeliever is demon-possessed, but every person who is an unbeliever is under the sway of the wicked one. Jesus wants to come and bind the strong man and release those people so that they can come to know Jesus Christ. And Jesus has power to do that, to bind Satan. Jesus can bind him with a word. Be quiet and come out of him, he said to the demon-possessed man. And the demon would come out. And you know what? I think that we should be praying consistently that Jesus Christ would bind the enemy in the lives of people all around this community. Lives of people that we know who don't know Jesus Christ, that Satan would be bound, that they would be free to come and to receive Christ. Satan has duped millions of people into believing that there's no God, that there's no judgment, that there's no hell. There's no such thing as sin. Why do we need God? And they're blindly just going on to hell. And we need to pray that Jesus Christ would bind Satan. Now, I don't recommend that you carry on lengthy conversations with the enemy. Just a short, it is written, is enough. Jude verse 9 says that Michael the archangel disputed with Satan over the body of Moses. And he didn't bring a reviling accusation against him, but he just said, the Lord rebuke you. He stood behind Jesus Christ, Michael the archangel, this powerful angel, and he said, the Lord rebuke you. And so if if you're ever contending with the enemy in your thought life, something going on in your family and in your life, the Lord rebuke you. Or it is written. But no lengthy conversations with him. But I do encourage you to... Pray, to pray that Jesus Christ would bind the enemy and do this before you share the gospel with someone else. That the enemy would be bound, that they'd be set free to hear the gospel and to respond. Well, in verse 28, he says, Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they may utter. But he who blasphemes against the Holy Spirit never has forgiveness, but is subject to eternal condemnation because they said he has an unclean spirit. The blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, otherwise known as the unpardonable sin. Now, in Luke chapter 4, verse 14, we read this. This is after Jesus was baptized. He came up. The Holy Spirit came upon him like a dove in bodily form. And he was empowered for his earthly ministry. It says, Then Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit to Galilee, and news of him went through all the surrounding region, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified by all. And so he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovery of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and proclaim the acceptable year of the Lord. Then he closed the book and gave it back to the attendant and sat down. And the eyes of all who were in the synagogue were fixed on him. And he began to say to them, Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. They knew that to be that that messianic scripture of the one who would come and would do these miracles. And he said, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to do this work. Notice that. Jesus baptized, came out of the water, Holy Spirit came upon him to empower him for his earthly ministry. Wasn't like he wasn't God before that? He was. He was always God. He was God in human flesh for those 30 years and then he was filled with the Spirit and he relied on the Spirit to do the works of miracles that he did. He says there, today the scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. Now, What Jesus is saying there is, I'm Messiah. And the Spirit of the Lord is upon me to do the work of Messiah. The Spirit of the Lord was working through Jesus 
preaching, teaching, healing, and casting out demons. And the miracles that he did proved that he was the Messiah. Now when the Jewish leaders said that Jesus was casting out demons by Beelzebub, they were calling the Holy Spirit Satan. And that's the blasphemy against the Holy Spirit. And it's an eternal sin. Now some people come and they'll ask me, have I committed the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit? Have I committed the unpardonable sin? And my answer to them is this. The fact that you care that you've done that means that you haven't done it. Because a person who doesn't yield to the Holy Spirit, who doesn't care, is a person who just goes to their death without even accepting that Jesus is the Messiah. The Holy Spirit's job is to convict unsaved people of sin, of righteousness and judgment, and to lead a person to Jesus. If you reject Jesus Christ your whole life, until you die, you have resisted the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. You've resisted the witness of the Spirit upon your heart. And if you've done that, you cannot be forgiven. What is the only sin that God cannot forgive? It's the sin of rejecting Jesus Christ. He can forgive any other sin. Notice what he says in verse 28. Assuredly, I say to you, all sins will be forgiven, the sons of men, and whatever blasphemies they may utter. The only sin that he cannot forgive is the sin of rejecting Jesus Christ. And the work of the Holy Spirit is to bring a person to the knowledge that they need Jesus Christ. And so if you reject that, you cannot be saved. Well, then his brothers and his mother came. And standing outside, they sent to him, calling him. And a multitude was sitting around. And they said to him, look, your mother and your brothers are outside seeking you. But he answered them, saying, who is my mother or my brothers? And he looked around in a circle at those who sat about him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. And whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and mother. Now these verses may come as a shock to anyone who has a Roman Catholic background. Because look what he says there in verse 33. Who is my mother? Who is my mother? In Roman Catholic theology, they're taught that Mary is the mother of God. Mary is the mother of God. Mary was the mother of his humanity, but not the mother of God, not the mother of his divinity. You know, we shouldn't worship Mary. And, you know, sometimes even as Protestants, we sort of get in this Mary bashing kind of we're down on Mary because we're rebelling against what other people worship in Mary. I mean, Mary we should remember that she was a blessing. And she was blessed among women and chosen to bring Jesus Christ into the world. But we certainly shouldn't worship her or deify her in any kind of way or pray to her or think that she is the mother of God. I think that Mary herself would be horrified to think that people do this about her. She said this in in Luke 1 verse 46, My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoiced, has rejoiced in God my Savior. He has regarded the lowly state of his maidservant. For behold, henceforth all generations will call me blessed. Yeah, they'll call her blessed, but not the mother of God. She was the mother of Jesus' humanity, but she wasn't the mother of God. Notice also in verse 31, it says, Then his brothers and his mother came and standing outside they sent to him calling him he had brothers there's this teaching about the perpetual virginity of Mary she was a virgin but she kept on being a virgin after Jesus was born well it says in Mark 6 verse 3 that he had at least four brothers and at least two sisters so it was a pretty big house you know seven kids at least in the house and so she wasn't perpetually a virgin But notice, 
Verses 34 and 35, and this is where we'll close. And he looked around in a circle at those who sat about him and said, Here are my mother and my brothers. And whoever does the will of God is my brother and my sister and mother. The relationship that we can have with other Christians is stronger and more intimate than even our blood families. John writes about this in 1 John chapter 1. He says, That which we have seen and heard we declare to you that you may also have fellowship with us. And truly, our fellowship was with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. The word for fellowship there is a Greek word koinonia. It means a complete sharing, an intimacy, a oneness that you can have with someone else who's a Christian. You can have koinonia with other believers, but you cannot have koinonia with people who are unbelievers. You cannot have fellowship with unbelievers. Keep that in mind over the holidays as we come up to Christmas and New Year. And you're going to be around a lot of family. You may want it to be a a certain way, a real special way, a certain intimacy with those people. You may think that you want to have fellowship or koinonia with them, but you'll never get it. You can have a laugh with them. You can remember old times. You can love them. But you'll never have koinonia with somebody outside of the body of Christ. Because koinonia is only for Christians. And this intimacy is so awesome. Jesus looks around at the people that he's, he's teaching and he says, These are my mother and my brothers and my sister. This is your family. It's an intimate thing. So I'd encourage you to pray for your family, your blood family, that they would be saved. That way you can have that intimacy with them. But don't be shocked if you are left a little disappointed with that time over the holidays. I want to pray. And then what I'd like to do is just spend a little time now with you as a family ministering to one another, loving one another, praying for one another. If anyone in here needs prayer for anything, would like to come up and pray for a healing, some of the leaders will be up here, we'll anoint you with oil, we'll pray for you. But I'd like you to split up into groups of maybe five, four or five, three or four or five, whatever, and just pray for one another. Ask each other how you're doing. Pray for one another. We've got plenty of time before the teas and coffees are served. Let's not rush through this. Let's minister to one another and love each other. Build each other up. So, let's pray and then we'll do that. Father, we just want to give you thanks for your word this morning. I want to thank you, Lord, that you use nobodies. That you love the scum and the offscouring of the earth. The filth. The people that the world say, oh, that's just nothing. They're just nobodies. You use them, Lord. You love them. Your heart is moved with compassion for them, Lord. Lord, we love you and we thank you, God, for loving us. We thank you for putting us into a family of believers that we may have intimacy and oneness with one another. And we pray now as we minister to one another that you'd use us. We pray that you'd use the gifts that you have given to us to minister and to build up the body of Christ that we may become mature and healthy. Lord, what a blessing it is to have received gifts from you that we may share them. It's like Christmas morning. We praise you this morning, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.